Welcome to Faith and Leadership on DFW Alive. I'm your host, Jerry Jacob, and I'm so excited to be here with you today on the last Friday of Lent before we get to Good Friday, which is really um, uh, brings us to the pinnacle of our faith. Um, it's uh, a wonderful week, a wonderful time in uh, in our time and in salvation history. It's always a wonderful time because we are here and we are now, and uh, this is all about the new evangelization in the words of uh uh, many, many saintly people, including our our special uh, holy Pope John Paul II. Um, we have an amazing show for you today. Um, this this show has been um, has really been through um, uh, quite a number of, of iterations. We've actually had a couple of people planned uh, to be on, and uh, uh, I'm going to tell you about some guests that are going to be on the show uh, during the next week. Uh, but this show is really about uh, sort of a central central concern in all of our lives, and it's called The Problem of Evil and How to Solve It. And uh, we have an amazing guest for you and an amazing interview and a conversation, a little bit unlike many of the shows we typically have with you, but uh, you're going to love it. And uh, we do appreciate your being on with us and uh, taking a few minutes of your time this this Friday. Let us start with uh, with a prayer, uh, and and it's uh, in particular a prayer that is uh, that is close to our hearts, uh, that is part of our um, part of the, the the paternity of our faith, uh, and so uh, we're going to invoke the blessing and the and the grace that comes from the Holy Spirit. So in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Amen. Um, A simple prayer, but a powerful prayer, and the Holy Spirit has been so incredibly uh, fruitful and and, uh, gracious in our lives in recent days and weeks, and we want to talk about it. But first, I want to introduce our special guest. Um, You know, we have amazing guests on the show. The, The theme of the show is faith and leadership, and we bring you exemplary leaders from Many walks of life, we've had the the blessing of being able to do that for quite a number of years now, and and I always walk away inspired and moved and ready to follow them in their walk of faith, uh, because each person brings a special a special pathway. You know, Saint Paul said, "There are many uh, fruits, but the same Spirit. There are many gifts, but the same Spirit." And and quite frankly, uh, what are we here to do? We are here to bring disciples to the Lord. That's the only commission that really matters on this earth um, after we, we seek that union with God. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm uh, of a certain age, I'll just put it that way, uh, from a generation that, uh, that over the last few decades has really struggled to find its footing, to find its, its faith, to find God. We've been led astray uh, by quite a number of, of actors, including ourselves, frankly. Sometimes the greatest evil resides within ourselves. And, of course, today we're talking about the problem of evil. But what's so gratifying and so hope-filled for me is the notion that the youngest generations that we that are, that are with us, our uh, young adults, our teens, and our children, uh, really don't have that baggage. Don't have the baggage of of those uh, like myself that grew up in the 70s and 80s and the 90s and the aughts and really uh, went astray um, and and uh, and tried to find uh, our our fruition and to find our uh, our hope in so many of the wrong of the wrong things in in, in the world. And uh, and so I'm so inspired by the youngest generations that are with us. And today I have with me, <laughs> I call, I, in one of my email uh, messages, I said, this is the next gen solution. And I truly believe that I am, I am so inspired by this gentleman and by uh, everyone that he represents. Welcome to the show, Jack Garda. Thank you for that great introduction, Jerry. It's good to be here. Well, Jack, uh, you have, um, I know you and, and, uh, know, uh, so much of what you've done, and I certainly don't know everything that you've done. I love your family, uh, love your parents, uh, your siblings. Uh, you are an alumnus of the illustrious Cistercian Preparatory School and, and of a number of other things in your life. So, uh, Jack, you come with a long history and a long record of amazing achievements, but I'm, I'm confident that the, the greatest things lie ahead of you. But Jack, um, you know, uh, 
what you're doing today is is uh, fills me with hope, fills me with 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 inspiration. So t- uh, give us just a, a, a quick vignette. Tell us a little bit about what you do and what's what you're passionate about these days. Absolutely. So I'm Jack Garda. I am a graduate of Cistercian Preparatory School. Uh, Cistercian is based in Irving, Texas. I graduated, I was the class of 2015, and Cistercian taught me a lot of really great things. Instilled in me a strong Catholic education. I learned so much about theology and apologetics in my six years that I was there. And it taught me how to become disciplined. Cistercian does an amazing job at allowing the the boys to become excellent in a variety of different fields. It's not purely academics. They have sports. They have social opportunities. They have service opportunities. There's so many different ways to flourish as a young man at Cistercian, and it was a it was an instrumental part of my upbringing and forming the man that I am today. So I'm thankful for my time of Cistercian. I, a little background of me, um, both my parents went to Notre Dame. I have aunts that have gone to Notre Dame. My grandfather went to Notre Dame. <laughs> we wow. are a big Catholic family. Yeah. So um, to be able to further that Catholic um, upbringing within a Catholic education is something that I am very grateful for. So where I am today... I've kind of been all around. Um, I ended up studying. I went from Cistercian to study at Vanderbilt University based in Nashville, Tennessee. I majored in economics while I was there, and I've worked in a variety of different roles. I've worked in wealth management. I've worked in corporate strategy and product management at a large Fortune 500 company, and I've worked in strategy consulting at a big four accounting firm. I spent some time doing that and working different corporate roles and ultimately left that to try to be my own boss and go out in the the scary line of work as an entrepreneur. Yeah. Um, What I'm currently doing is actually focused on spreading a message of love through Jesus Christ to empower people to live their best human experience. And I am doing that on by trying to create uh, different social media and content. Um, I, I never would post in social media before. Um, I would just consume, consume, consume. Yeah. And, um, if you look at my generation, the millennial slash Gen Z generation and younger, you're seeing more and more people with that are, that are fallen into this consumption mindset. Social media is designed to be heavily addictive and work on our dopamine in in ways that are ultimately destructive and leading people away from truth, away I, from God. I like Jack. I like to call it anti-social media, but yeah, not, not, not a popular. exactly anti anti-social with as as it pertains to real social connection with organic human connection, which is how we were designed for thousands of years, and now we're having to do this in a digital space that, you know, 25 years ago we didn't even have the internet. So yeah, um, we we're, we're not we're not evolved to to deal with this. This, um, this exponential growth that we're experiencing, and it's not yeah. good for the human soul. But anyway, yeah. um, my my whole mission with doing content and and creating creating social media content is to try to be a voice of love, yeah. uh, to try to spread the truth of Jesus Christ on on these different platforms. So yeah. I'm currently making YouTube videos. I'm making TikToks. I am yeah. making uh, Instagram posts. That that platform whose name will never be mentioned. It okay. was just mentioned uh, on the show. It's, it's like Voldemort. <laughs> I shouldn't have said it. Um, I will refrain from mentioning uh, the, the Chinese company. Uh, we'll have to move forward from that. But um, yeah, I, on on that platform, I just I, I I pray for people each day. So I really try to be a light on these platforms. But yeah, that's what I'm working on now. I have uh, I have other sort of small businesses uh, that have allowed me to to make income and uh yeah i'm 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 just i'm trying to hustle and i'm trying to do everything yeah. that i can well you know and, so. and and that's the uh jack what i what what i am so excited about is that uh we're so complacent in our faith i mean we could talk about this i don't want to dwell on the negative uh but so many of us will spend a lifetime 
searching and seeking and perfecting ourselves before we'll ever have the courage to put a foot forward and say, hey, accompany me into this walk of faith. And and guess what? Guess what Christ said? And guess what our directive is? Don't prepare before you. I will. You will. I will give you the words to speak. Uh, bring bring one cloak. Uh, bring one pair of sandals. If they don't welcome you, move on. Uh, I'm paraphrasing the Holy Scripture here, but uh, but Christ didn't say get perfected and then go out and and yeah. and bring people to me. And and uh, you know what? I think there's something ravishingly beautiful about the way the Holy Spirit and the Lord equip us. You were at baptism. You were equipped to draw people into, into the church. Yeah, and you. Um, I love the, the the title of one of the the TOKs that you sent out, uh, <laughs> uh, Jack. What was the one the this Voldemort. morning? You showed me? The one that said, uh, uh, do, "Do you, you have, have time for God? Do you have time for God?" What a simple question. And I'm going to gonna gonna give everybody a um, a little a little vignette. You know, I don't want to. This is not a this is not a spoiler. It's a spoiler alert. How do you solve the problem of evil? Guess Ooh. what? We already have that solution. I don't want to. I don't want to be cute. I just want to be substantial and solid. Prayer is the solution to the problem of evil. Meaning, inviting God into our lives, inviting God to do what He can do, and allowing Him to take control, turns out to be the solution. We. I can't solve it on my own, can I, Jack? Yeah. You're, you're you're totally right. Like God, God is the one that works. God is the one that overcomes evil, and that is seen so tangibly in the person of Jesus Christ and His life, death, and resurrection. Right. Um, something that I've experienced recently, just talking about the concept of evil, because evil is one of the things that separates people from living a religious life. They say, how can there be a benevolent God if there's evil in the world? How can there be such, you yeah. claim, you Christians claim that there's this good God. Yeah. How is that possible yeah. when there are such evil atrocities in this world? And that's a hard question. Yeah. That is that is a hard question for Catholics, Christians alike, to yeah. to try to rationalize, mm-hmm. to how, how is there a benevolent? It, it doesn't seem to add I don't, up. But. Well, I, I don't have an answer, but I'm going to add a little thought to this, to the to the to, the, to that uh, question, the solution. The one thing God is so benevolent and so loves us that He never is going to take away our free will. Mm-hmm. He wants us to have the liberty. That's the one thing He will not do. He will not step in our path if we're making a, a free choice. Yeah. And that's part of the answer. Yeah, and I, and I think also part of the answer is just realizing that the reality of the world is we don't live in a perfect utopia. We live in right. a world where there is good and evil. Yeah. And if everything was good, w- would it really be good? That's like right. That's right. The, the shine, the, the light shines brightest within the darkness. And it is yeah. that yin and yang. It is that flow between good and evil that makes it so powerful what i was going to say regarding evil is that a lot of us at least in my experience yeah i never wanted to confront the own evil in my heart jerry earlier you mentioned that we have evil within us and, and that is that is true we we are we are we sinners all we all do. we have we have good and evil within yeah. us all well but, I, I said yesterday to my daughter <laughs> um we carry within the we're such a mystery we carry within us the sacred and the profane Mm-hmm. Uh, and our entire our life can be a reaching toward the good or a reaching toward the evil. A hundred, hundred percent. And for for me, I don't know if anyone listening can relate to this, but in my walk, I had a really, really hard time confronting the evil in my life. Um, just looking internally, I was okay to look at the beautiful parts of my life and the parts of my life that I felt resembled Christ, but I didn't feel like I could touch. The evil parts. I didn't feel like I could bring awareness to the evil parts of my heart and soul. Um, yeah. And and for me, that made me ineffective to being more like Christ because I couldn't eliminate the darkness within me. And we yeah. see uh, from a Catholic lens how amazing the sacrament of confession is because yeah. it's it's dedicating time to say, okay, I'm actually going to spend this time to confront the evil inside of me. Yeah. I'm going to spend this time to confront where I've fallen and where I've sinned because well, that brings about a greater perfection yeah. in Christ. That's right. Well you you know, there's in the very same breath and I wanna I wanna mention two things. One, and it's a notion of mercy. Right? God's mercy is 
Uh, it really, it, it, I don't know that there's any bounds to God's mercy, right? Divine mercy is boundless. And, um, and the thing is that, that w- what you said, I found so much evil in myself. Well, Jack, <laughs> um, you're not alone. And in fact, it, that's so true, that statement that we needed, the, the first human beings were originally in a state of perfection. They were in the garden with God. And and yet, here here's what God does. He takes evil, takes bad things, and then he turns them, in. because of them, he uses them to find good. So here's what happened. If our original, our first parents, Adam and Eve, had not sinned, had not turned away from God, we would never have had in salvation history God himself coming to earth, uh, becoming incarnated and living amongst us and living with us. So... I, amazingly enough, that first evil, which, because of which we're all broken and imperfect, brought about a greater good. God yeah. himself dwelt among us. And so mercy, uh, and, and that's merciful. That's merciful in its to the nth degree. Yeah. I can't think of, just comparatively, I can't think of another denomination or faith or, or, or faith life or faith cause, religious approach, where God himself, I mean, he, he creates us. Uh, and and instills gives us everything, and then because we screw it up and 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 say nope, I'm going the other direction, he says I'm so merciful, I'm going to send myself, my son down to you, I'm gonna have him, I'm gonna allow him to be killed because of this evil, and that's going to unleash the the boundless font font of mercy which we live with now. But yeah, Jack, the sacrificial lamb. Absolutely. Yeah, I just to add on to what you said, I mean that was that was a brilliant uh synopsis of the gospel, but to to add on to that it's hard dealing with evil. Mm-hmm. It's cuz evil is is rooted in sin and sin is separation from God and God is the highest good. So yeah. I I just want to say um we have to be aware of shame. Shame is yeah. the lowest vibrational emotion. Mm. It is it is telling us a lie yeah. that we are not worthy. loved. We are not worthy. Yeah. And it goes hand in hand with evil. We we, yeah. we commit evil atrocities, we feel shame. Yeah. We feel shame and it leads us to commit evil atrocities. It's a cycle. Right. And um, it's it, and the opposite of that is is love. So we need to have awareness for when we feel shame, and realize that that comes from Satan. That right. is not from Jesus. It says that Christ did not come to condemn the world; he right. came to overcome the world. That's so right. we need to be aware of this shame. Right. We look at the person of Paul. Yeah. He wrote most of the New Testament. Yeah. And brilliant. He, the the most brilliant evangelist and, in in time. I've, and yeah, right. and Paul says. Of all sinners, I am most chief among them. Yes. That is his approach, yep. is saying, hey, <laughs> of all the sin, he yep. owns his sin. He yep. wears it vulnerably, yep. and he says, of all the sinners, look at me. I'm the most chief among them. Yep. That is how we should take an approach yep. as it pertains to sin. It yep. shouldn't be something that, oh, I need to hide away. I need to have shame. I can't I can't live this out. Yes. We need to realize that we're all sinners, and yep. we need to root in empathy. We yep. need to be like Paul and cast out our our shame yeah. openly wear our flaws <laughs> be open and honest and vulnerable with our sin because it is through that open and honesty that sin doesn't have power because it hides in the shadows and we can overcome it yeah. and come together to be more like Christ together hallelujah yeah you know sin acknowledge sin and evil in the world and in fact <laughs> you know let's let's get rid of the words in the world acknowledge sin in myself that's a, I mean, we we'll, we have a continual conversation about shame because shame truly is such an impediment. I've I've felt it and lived it in my own life, for certain cultural reasons and other reasons. Um, uh, I only I, I'll I'll tell you, Jack, and that's why I think how brilliant you are. I didn't I didn't discover the importance or the or the negative importance of shame until just a few years ago, and had no idea how influential and how powerful that was in our life. We are talking today with Jack Garda, who is a digital creator, an entrepreneur, and a next gen uh, influence on all of us, who is helping to teach us how we can overcome the problem of evil in the world. This is. Faith and Leadership on DFW Live, and we'll be back in just a couple of moments. To us, right? So, Jack, talk a little bit more about shame and about about th- th- this concept here. Yeah. Um, thanks, Jerry. So, 
shame, I think it's important to highlight the distinction between shame and guilt. They guilt is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, guilt can be an indicator that we have fallen and we have sinned. Yeah. Um, guilt can be a reminder that whatever action or behavior that we're doing is causing distance between us and God. Yeah. Um, Shame's a whole different beast. Yes, right. <laughs> Shame fills your identity. It fills your energy. Shame overcomes you, and you have a hard time feeling and experiencing the light. Yeah. Shame is a complete perception and reality shift. Um, and I think a lot of times early on when we are first experiencing shame, we don't even have awareness for it. We just feel our spirit go dark and we're like, I don't even know what's going on. So that's that's why my conversation that I'm trying to bring this morning is trying to get everyone to understand that it's OK to feel shame because it's natural, because it's one of the recompenses of sin. Yeah. Sin is turning away from God. Yeah. And if you turn away from God. You might feel guilt, and if you let guilt fester too long, it can it can materialize into shame. Yes. So I just, going back to what I was saying before, I just think it's so important to not judge ourselves. Yeah. To develop there self-love. Is, there is an eternal judge. There is a divine judge, and it's not ourselves. It's not ourselves. It's God. Right. Exactly. That's right. exactly right. right. And we see in the Gospels that God doesn't look at us for our guilt and for our shame. He looks at us the same way he looks at Christ on the cross. Yes. Christ on the cross in that sacrificial moment takes on all all of our shame, all of our sin, all of our separation from God yeah. and is the perfect bridge between us and God in the flesh yeah. of Jesus Christ. Well, so it's know, yeah, it's incredible and and I want to uh, bring something I want to amplify something you said. Christ on the cross had two thieves next to him, a good thief and another Dismas, you probably remember. Who were the Dismas and who was the other one? Cecil? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's I'm putting you in the spot. Day. You are. You work for Catholic Come on, Radio, Sissel. Sissel. Okay, no, we don't need. We don't need the name. <laughs> we don't need the name. Anyway, here's the thing. There were two thieves. One turned to Christ and said, "If you're God, you know, help yourself. Get off that cross. Solve this." And the other thief said, "Hush up." <laughs> this is this is absolutely a a little a little uh, paraphrase, paraphrase of scripture. <laughs> Hush up. This, that's a that's a southern way to say it. Um, uh, Lord. <laughs> I, I don't know what the exact words but were, but whatever he said melted Jesus' heart on the cross, right? Right on the cross, he said. That, in fact, it's the first person he took that in salvation history that Christ that Christ um, brought to heaven. He said, "This day you will be with me in paradise." By the way, I want to add one other thing, a little light that I had a couple of days ago. Does and we're in the season of Lent, speaking about guilt and shame and evil. Does anybody ever stop and consider that Christ? After his resurrection, or before his resurrection, after he was crucified, he spent three days in hell. That's a temporal dimension, three days. What do you think he was doing in hell for three days? Why is that in our faith, and why do we ignore that? What did he do in hell? And and it's eternally a hopeful notion for me, because guess what that says? God is bigger than hell. Mm. God is bigger than evil. And Christ said, I am going to go be with my lambs, you know, be with my people, with my sheep, with my goats, maybe. Yeah. I'm going to be next to them. And even in hell, and see, this is what gives me hope. Even hell has exposure to God, to, yeah. to, to Christ, to the Son. He did something there. I, I'm going to figure it out at some point, maybe after the beatific vision, but he yeah. did something in hell. No, that's so beautiful. I, I, to, to build off what you said, Jerry, I... Uh, what what's hitting me in the face is Luke 15. Mm. Luke chapter 15, we see a parable. Jesus loves talking in parables and analogies and we see the shepherd. Yeah. And one of the 99 sheep gets lost astray. Yeah. And obviously Jesus is the metaphor for the shepherd, but yeah. once again to reiterate what shame does is it makes you think you're not worthy right. and makes you feel like you are not deserving of love. And I think we've all experienced this yeah. Christian and non-Christian alike. Yeah. But how does Jesus respond to the one that falls away in yeah. Luke 15? He, he runs, runs he runs 
after the mm-hmm. one. He leaves the right. 99 right. to go after the one. And we see that right. as the one, when the one returns back, there is more rejoicing than even the 99 that stayed righteous. Absolutely. And that is so beautiful. So if your story, which was my story for so long, is that why would God love me? I don't I don't deserve God's love. There's hope. Yeah, there is there's, hope. There's hope. There's redemption. We have a father that runs after us. There's nothing that we yeah. have to bring to them. All we have to bring is our faith in Jesus and, Christ. And, and, and when we bring that, ourselves. we are met with absolute love and there is rejoicing. So do not believe that lie that shame whispers in your ear. Do not believe that lie that you are not good enough. That is a lie from Satan and it does not serve you and it is not rooted in scripture and it is not leading you to God. We're, we're human beings. We're not that swift. So Christ had to tell us this a number of different ways over and over again. So so I, I just love the prodigal son, right? So, yeah, great one too. Right, so, so, so the father... Uh, you know the the son who's living with him and and you know gets is so upset and annoyed as if he could control the fa- as if we can control God's response to sinners but but the father s- says son the son says what, what do you mean I've been with you all these years I'm doing your bidding yeah. and uh, where's me- my cloak yeah where's my you- fat and cat and this kid this kid who <laughs> lives lives with swine and with prostitutes he's he's been gone for years he used up the inheritance and you see him miles away and you go running, running out and him. and and it, actually, Jack, um, I don't know how to how to articulate this really well, but I'll just sort of give you what's on my heart. I think there's something beautiful and profound in here about God's love for the little guy, for the for the disenfranchised, for us actually when we are in sin. Because I'll say this: when I've been struggling, when I've had difficult, dark moments, and when I'm pouring my heart out to him like a father, and I can say this as a father, as a, as a human father, that's when I most, am, I'm most endeared to my children, when I know they're struggling, when I know they don't know how to ask. I can see this in the lives of my own children. I've got, uh, I've got three children, and, and uh, uh, they're human beings, and, and each has moments of, of, of imperfection, and each has moments of beautiful, um, close to perfection. And, and yet... Even among them, right? I see that that my children don't necessarily have not necessarily yet matured to understand that that it's not the actions from moment to moment of their siblings. It's not the error of their siblings' ways. That 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 it's the it's who they are and they're children of God and they're eternally precious. And I see that. And I see when my children make mistakes and screw up and and are unlovable sometimes. Mother Teresa, a great hero of mine, always says, we need to see God in the distressing disguise of the people that are most unlovable. Anand Bhimarasetti, who leads Project Finding Calcutta, came and gave a talk to a group that I that I belong to in recent weeks, and he said something. He reminded me what Mother Teresa said, in the West, the greatest poverty we, poverty we have is the lack of love for each other. And it's not material poverty, although there's certainly some of that. And Christ said, the poor you will always have with you. But it's the poverty of not having time for each other, of not having, you know, when I pass that homeless guy on the street, you know, I'm digging in my pocket sometimes for a coin or a, or a bill. But I sure am not digging into my own life to say, hey, stop. Take five minutes. Get out of the car. <laughs> I might scare one of the other drivers, but get out of the car. Go ask him, hey, what's your name? Mm. What's going on? I don't have your prob- the solution to your problem. But, hey, my I am the hands and the feet and the instrument of God, yeah. and my human connection to you is what's going to help bring you back to God. That's it. I can't give you enough money. To, to, I, I don't have enough money to solve all the problems of the world. We think we do sometimes. We think we're so powerful. Yeah. You mentioned the parable of the prodigal son, and when you mentioned that, Jerry, I, I just got hit with a what I think is a, a beautiful image. Uh, we, we define sin as turning away from God, yeah. and we see the result of that in the parable of prodigal son, complete waste. Literally, the prodigal son is sitting in pig waste and eating pig food. Right. Um, or wants to eat pig food. He can't even get can't the pig, even food. Get pig food. And yeah. he and he says, well, maybe I can go back to my dad and maybe he'll accept me as a servant. So 
what we see in the parable of the prodigal son is when we're residing in a place of shame, when we feel that evil has overcome us, when we feel that God has given up on us, which is a complete lie, but it's a feeling that I think we can all relate to. Yeah. All that we have to do is turn to God. Sin is turning away from God. All that God is asking us yeah. as visibly seen in the parable of the prodigal son is to turn towards him. Yeah. You see in the parable of the prodigal son that he doesn't even get to the father. He just starts walking home. He just sees his father. And how is he met? How is God the father? How does God the father meet us when we decide we're going to turn towards him? We run, he runs, he runs after, after us. us. <laughs> he gives us the fattened calf. He gives us the nicest There's a cloak. Theme there, he, he gives he runs us, after the, us. The, the nicest things of this world. And all that he's asking us to do is turn towards him yes so if you feel that you are so down on your luck have yeah. you eaten pig poop today maybe <laughs> not it, it was worse for the prodigal son and he yeah. was met with love so all that we're asked to do is turn towards him it's not us yeah it's christ within us yeah well and 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 again i want to remind listeners we this wasn't just a teaser this show actually is how to solve the problem of evil. <laughs> and Dave Palmer on my way into the studio said, Jerry, really? You're going to solve the problem of evil on one radio show? And I said, yes, we are. Yes, we are. Because you know what? I can do all things through God. And <laughs> we're not, I'm not doing anything at all. I'm simply pointing out a really simple, a really plain and easy little solution. Oh, by the way, in those of us that want handrails, that want guidelines, that want a systematic approach. See, that's that's not me. I'm not the guy with the systematic theology approach. Uh, I'm looking at a book by St. Francis de Sales called An Introduction to the Devout Life. He's got some amazing, amazing things. There's so much good reading, spiritual reading and others, and just good people. I'm all about following the Spirit. My wife would say, Jerry, make a plan, write it down, have guidelines. You know, I, lo I love my dear wife, Judith, but she is approaches this different from me, differently from me. And we all have a different gift in approaching the spiritual life. And thank God for her. If it weren't for her, I'd be in some I'd be in that pig swill right now. But 35 years later, she she's my rock. But God has given us some rules and some guidelines. And for those of you that are looking for handrails, there are some handrails that were written a couple of thousand years ago. And they sound it sounds simple. The Ten Commandments. <laughs> I oh. was talking to a to a priest, a very close friend of mine named Father Mark Riley, who's a past diocesan priest in Ogdensburg, New York, uh, Northern. He and I went to high school together. Brilliant and wonderful man. He said, yeah, um, we don't have to try so hard. How do we turn back to God? Uh, what are the handrails? Those of us that want a cheat sheet, it's called the Ten Commandments. It tells you it's pretty simple. You know, don't put any other gods before me. Don't get don't get wedded to all the lures of the world, i.e. Don't let material goods, material things be lead you. And the rest of the Ten Commandments, uh, which I'm not going to list here, but all of us can know those and can find those. But again, evil has already been conquered. We are going to come back in just a couple of minutes uh, on faith and leadership. Uh, we are the show is also called DFW Live. And we're so happy to be with you for a few more minutes today. Uh, we will come back with our last segment on solving the problem of evil on KTH 910 AM. DFW Live. Jerry Jacob here with Jack, Jack Garda, who is uh, an entrepreneur and a digital creator. Jack, um, uh, some of those uh, platforms I'm not terribly fond of just because of what they represent but uh how might people find you and the work you do it is inspiring I, let me let me and i do have very close friends who are very active on those those channels who say well jerry you got to be in there you got to be in the world and you got to confront the world and you can't just sort of run away from it so i've taken the path of running away from these big giant technology companies who will not be named but but I, I understand people live in those platforms. I'm sure that that I'm I'm being pigheaded, but or <laughs> pigheaded, which is a funny analogy. But Jack, how might people find you? Yeah, no, <laughs> I do not blame you for <laughs> refraining from those um, those sites. I just create content. I don't consume it because <laughs> if I start scrolling on my for you page, I don't stop. <laughs> um, this is for you. Somebody is going to tell you what's for you. You mean not oh, besides God is yeah, telling you what's I for know, you? I <laughs> know, I know, I know. Yeah, exactly. Um, the algorithm is going to tell you what's for you, and it's pretty dang good at it. Um, but I have to, I have to refrain um, because I, I, 
part of maturing for me has been realizing that if I put myself in a, a position to succeed, I'm way more successful. Part of freedom is having boundaries. Freedom is not doing whatever you want to do, but uh, it's creating constraints in your life that can bring about the greatest good yeah to be more like christ so anyway um (laughs) you can find me on youtube under jack garda just my name g-a-r-d-a uh that's the same for the uh TikTok, uh, the Chinese oh. app. Um, well, I just, I'm, I just took a hit to the. Yeah, sorry, collection. sorry. Uh, I, I pri- primarily just pray on that. So yeah. if you guys want to just pray with me, uh, join me on on that app. And then um, I'm also on on Instagram, and I'm going to be posting a lot of my content on Instagram as well. And then it's that's Jack underscore Garda G A R D A. So I really appreciate uh, okay. any support. Well, okay, so I feel better now because you know what I just realized. Um, you know, blessed, blessed sacramentals, right? Holy water, blessed salt, other things can, uh, can consecrate evil things in evil places. Yeah. So by your presence, Jack, <laughs> that's the we're hope. T- <laughs> we're I'm t- trying to be a light on this dark platform because I felt like I was very dark in it at one point. It takes one to know one, right? Yeah, so. <laughs> it takes one to know one. Paul, I am the chief sinner. <laughs> so no, but, but yes, I, I, I have to say, right? We need to go walk in the marketplace. We need to go to the temple when it's being desecrated like yeah. Christ did and say, bring this, restore the sanctity of this place for my father, right? Uh, restore the sanctity of our human communion, of our communication with each other, of our dialogue. And this too shall pass. This too that, shall that pass. That platform starting with a T and the other platform starting with a U and has another big T in it, they will pass. They will yeah. be gone. I'm, I'm predicting two, three years before that big one's gone. But can you imagine? Yeah. Uh, the wild. world will be, will be shattered. There's, there's two or three words. One word, believe it or not, is rest. 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 There's another word, which, you know, some uh, Christians and Catholics, uh, don't necessarily love the notion of meditation, you know, the way that this world does meditation. But the Desert Fathers, St. Anthony, the monks, thousands of years ago, understood that if you want to escape the evils of the world, you go out into the desert. Christ did this himself. Yeah. You bring silence. You bring, in other words, nothing. You settle yourself down, and you allow God to speak to you. That's called silence. There's a book called Do Nothing, I think it's about meditation, and it's a great book. But but really, call it what you will, the labels don't matter. Rest, there's actually a word, a, a, a sentence that I used last, a week or two ago. Um, God says, I will do these things or you will not be allowed into my rest. What is God saying? God allows us to rest in him if we truly are abandoning ourselves we understand that we can rest in him, do nothing, let him do it all. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, in our earthly material human lives here, we can't do nothing. I'm also a great fan. I'm trying to reconcile these things, you guys. I'm also a great fan of Joan of Arc. Joan of Arc said um, when the French, some French nobility were saying to her, gee, if your God is so great, why don't you just let him do all the work? Why don't you just just not do much yourself or do nothing yourself? And she said, no, God says we must fight and do do battle, and he will give us the victory. We've got to understand that. We must fight, and God will give us the victory. God didn't say be passive in life. Absolutely, and in fact, we are the arms and legs and the and the ears and the eyes and the feet of, of Christ in the world. We're the instruments. And um, we have the capacity. I, do, I have found, and especially in recent days and weeks, that the spark of God lives in each of us and all it takes is to reach out to another human being and try to channel his love which means unconditionally to walk up to somebody and say hey I care about you I don't even know how how I care about you or why but I care about you and if I care about you then I am channeling God hey, Jerry you mentioned uh you mentioned peak brain and I just want to say I am a case study mm-hmm. of his peak brain oh, i'm sorry there there's some hippo restrictions here we can't describe I'm, I'm oh, just, oh okay just, i was no, like no, shoot no you can you can I was actually like, well, uh, I, i'm the okay <laughs> i'm the recipient but anyway peak brain if, if you guys are in the dfw area which is probably most of you um i strongly recommend you to check out peak brain for yourself for any families for any friends if you have any struggles with ADHD, which is like everyone in our in my generation. If you have been through any head trauma, I've been the recipient of five concussions. Yeah. Um, if you struggle with mental health in any way, um, if you struggle with stress, if you struggle with sleep, 
Um, I strongly recommend you to give Jerry Jacob a call for Peak Brain because it changed my life. Oh, how, I, do we, how do we end up doing a sponsorship on this show, an endorsement, <laughs> Sissel? Uh, you should cut him off right now I before you get FCC free. I think the is going to come after us now. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Honestly, not even an endorsement, but just, just if, if you guys care about the loved ones in your life and, and are looking for practical ways to help people that struggle with neurological imbalances in their brain, I think neurofeedback is an excellent way. But to go, it's it's more than just neurofeedback. What Jerry has created in Peak Brain is a complete mission around rest and trying to pursue God's love by healing people. Thank you. So Thank I, you. Um, Better I, than I could have said it I, myself. I, I, am a, I am a huge huge advocate for peak brain. Um, it has changed my life. I came in extremely skeptical. I read a lot of articles that, that, that said v- varying things about neurofeedback and its efficacy. But um, man, I came in super depressed, super, super, super depressed, ridden with OCD tendencies, like a fraction of myself. Oh. And I just spilled myself to Jerry over a, a Zoom call. And I was met with empathy. I was met with love. I was met with understanding. And through his help, I, he was able to put together a tailor-made program to me and my neuro profile. And I went in and did neurofeedback. It was a little bit of a drive, but we made it work. And yeah. I came in several times a week, and it transformed my life. Well, I, I, I was able to sleep better. I was able to function better. Yeah. And, and, and really, I was able to live my best life because I was able to rest. So yeah. um, I'm a huge advocate of, of Peak Brain. And, and just to... to, to Talk a little more about rest. Jerry, Jerry loves rest. Obviously, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's highly aligned with his, his, his work. But we, we live in a world right now, a, a, a monet, a monetaristic, capitalist driven world where you are being forced to have more and more output. More and more output is, is, is constantly at your demand. How much money are you creating? What are you able to actually show for yourself, right? From a monetary standpoint. Yeah. And we forget that rest is actually effective, right? Yeah. We are going to be more productive. We are going to be better family members. We're going to be better workers. We're going to be better people if we rest. We're like racehorses, yeah. right? Yeah. We're like racehorses. We, we, we need to run our race and we want to be fast and produce. Yeah. But what do you think the racehorses do in the next day? They're in the pool. They're taking sleep. They're getting their right. bodies worked on. Right. We need to, we needn't forget the importance of rest and recuperation yeah. as it pertains to everything in life, the spiritual walk, our own lives. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so fundamentally important. So yeah. um, thank you for helping me realize the well of jack I, i'm speechless really because there's nothing more beautiful and inspiring than the words of somebody like yourself who uh, t- to me what i pray for every day we pray for our clients we pray for our clients we bless our clients we actually name them uh as part of our work it's not something we advertise but we don't need to because you know uh, the good Lord knows what we do in private. Go into a closed room, close the door, and the good Lord knows. Nobody else knows and nobody else needs to know. But the fact really is several things that, that, that you brought up here. Um, one is that there's a refractory period. If anybody understands human biology or living biology, if anybody understands the natural world, physics, biology, chemistry, we every cell in our bodies... Every action that we have is a refractory action. And study up a little bit. Become Know the science. Don't follow the people that say they are the science. There's no such thing. It doesn't even, that, that, that's not even philosophically a correct statement to say I am the science. But anyway, science just means, means discovery and inquiry, right? Yeah. Inquiry. So as soon as somebody says, I am the science, we should say, yes, you are. That means we're going to inquire and we're going to ask you questions. And if you can't answer them, then we're going to boo you off the stage. But anyway, uh, but the rest... Is critically important. Um, so, as some of you know, I also have a, have a focus on sleep in one of our medical practices. <laughs> and sleep is that period, a third of our life, that is filled with cognitive rest. We are not driven to do anything. We're doing nothing. There's some people that say that our consciousness begins again every day the next morning. We go to sleep and we're not conscious. If we are slightly conscious, that means our sleep is of lower quality than it should be. And most of us are in that space in this country and in this society. But back to the point, rest is how our brain puts us back together intellectually each day. 
stores the important memories, ditches the poor memory, the, 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 the stimuli that have nothing to do with our with good things in our life, consolidates memories. So sleep is where we're not trying it. And, and I want to tell everybody here, yes, I said there were a couple, three words. Another is serenity. Um, serenity describes what we do at Peak Brain. And so Peak Brain is about helping the brain to regulate itself better. And by the way, um, confession, I tell everybody, every everyone coming in the door, the word we start and end with is humility. Because guess what? No one who claims to actually know what the brain is doing, they're not telling the truth. They're, it's such a mystery. Yeah. The brain is the most remarkably complex thing ever discovered by human beings. I could blow people's minds, and, and I talk to wonderful uh, doctors all the time. Neurologists are some of the humblest doctors I meet because, guess why? They work with the incredible complexity and mystery of the human brain, and they know better than to claim that they know it all. But neuroscientists, anybody who claims to have the answer, be skeptical. Ask questions. We don't even, we can't even plumb the depths of the brain. We don't even know. Uh, I, I'm going to ask a rhetorical question. We don't have time to answer it. What is consciousness? <laughs> what is consciousness? Awareness. Uh, but the thing is, consciousness, we can't really define exactly where it exists in our in our world. Uh, we're talking about faith here. We're talking about evil. I'm going to come come back to evil because my wife texted me and said, get back to faith now, Jerry. And so, <laughs> as usual, I have to follow my leaders. But but it, but, here, <laughs> but, but, but here's the thing about, there's a reason I'm going here. There is a God-sized hole in our brains. Yeah. And, and. So many scientists who have studied the brain and studied human consciousness say that, that that the practice of the faith, reaching toward God, which is what the show is all about, actually makes the brain better. We need it in our lives, and it's very clear when people don't have yeah. some sort of spirituality. And, I, and no matter where you are on the spiritual walk, uh, that, that it's critical that God fills a place in our life that, yes. and in our brains that no, nothing else can. Yes. Um, a couple of things I want to kind of throw out to you as we are coming to the end of the season of Lent, right? Um, uh, we don't need to try so hard. Scripture is the eternal Word of God, and yes. it's the inspired Word of God. Pick up Scripture. And by the way, don't try to do the Bible in a year. You you can do that. <laughs> but But doing the Bible in a year means we're doing it cognitively. God actually wants us to dwell in yeah. Scripture. Work he, on the heart. Yeah, Pope Benedict says it brilliantly. Christianity is not about knowledge. It's about a person. Yeah, a relationship. Just, just stop and say to yourself and say to Christ, I want to know you, Christ. I want to know you, Lord. Yeah. And I that's what this more. show is about. I'll repeat it because we haven't done it really well. The answer to the problem of evil is seek God in prayer, but just seek God. Turn to him. Hosea said it. Turn to him. And... And it's that simple and that profound. And in it, you will discover all the world. We don't have a lot of time. Anything else to say, Jack, before we have to sign off? Yeah, I just want to say thank you guys so much for welcoming me. Welcoming me. Yeah. <laughs> you guys are, are awesome. And, uh, yeah, I, God bless all of you all listening. Let's draw close to God and spread love together. That's that's the mission. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, in today's scripture, in today's reading from the gospel, Christ says, Is it not written in your law, you are God's? And we are co-creators, you guys. Jack, you're a creator, but guess what? We are co-creators with God of, of, of salvation and of history and of humanity. So thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you for this opportunity to indulge us. Jack, keep doing the incredible work you are. Thank you, Cecil. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. God bless. We'll see you next week, Friday at 11. Happy Friday.